Hey everyone, and welcome back to the series. Today we'll look at chapter 2, the multiplicity of conscious states, the idea of duration. As the title of the chapter suggests, Bergson's main focus will be to introduce this concept of duration. Throughout this chapter, we'll analyze our normal conception of time and contrast that with our actual experience of time. It will become clear that our common idea of time is thoroughly contaminated and confused with ideas of space. On the contrary, if we take a careful and nuanced look at our experience of time, that is, the experience of time flowing, not time flowing, we'll realize that time, in its pure form, has nothing in common with space. Or in Bergsonian terms, time is not extensive. The term duration is cleverly used by Bergson to denote this pure form of time, uncontaminated by spatial ideas. The use of this term duration is helpful in that the very uttering of the word time automatically and unconsciously calls up ideas of space. This distillation of space or extension from conscious experience should be familiar to us from chapter one. A helpful way to approach chapter two might be to see it as an elaboration of chapter one, where we broaden our view from individual sensations to the multiple states that make up our conscious experience. But for now, let's take a look at our common idea of time. So how do we visualize time? Actually, wait a second. Even in asking this seemingly harmless question, we have already made some assumptions about time. This reflex belief that we can represent time to ourselves visually or as an image, in itself, says a lot about how we relate to the topic. We see nothing incorrect in recalling the moments of our life or day and setting them side by side to form a timeline. In a lot of ways, this mode of thought is quite useful as it helps us organize our lives and communicate our experiences to each other. But if we want to understand our experience more thoroughly, we should take a look at what this image of time implies. The idea that time resembles a line shows that we think of time as sharing many of the same properties as space. Isolated events are depicted within the line of time, and they are separated from each other by the very medium they exist within. This is very similar to how we understand material objects in space. They exist simultaneously within space and are differentiated by that same medium. This linear image of time reveals that our default assumption is that we believe time to be a thing or a medium. I mean, look to our language. We say we exist within time, or that events took place within a day or an hour. As a result of thinking of time as a medium, we also believe it to be measurable in itself, just like space. This spatial representation of time seems intuitive and fundamentally useful for social beings, but does it say anything about our conscious experience itself? Let's take a look at our experience of a musical phrase or a melody and see how this compares to our spatial image of time. How do we experience a melody? Well, on one hand, we experience it as a series of parts or notes, yet we also experience it as a whole in itself. This idea of a thing being one and many is what Bergson and others call a multiplicity. Let's consider the structure of this multiplicity. As the notes of a musical phrase unfold, we must in some way retain the preceding notes into our present experience. Think about it. If only the present was given without any trace of the past, how could we experience the phrase as a whole? We endure the musical phrase by retaining the past into the present in an automatic synthesis. This synthesis of holding the past in the present in a sort of qualitative thickness is our temporal experience itself. In some ways, this insight might be calling up ideas of consciousness being a sort of container, but we must be careful here. Remember chapter 1, where Bergson firmly demonstrates that conscious states are non-extended? If consciousness is non-extensive, how could it hold multiple elements, such as the notes of a musical phrase? In keeping with the observations made in chapter 1, 
we'll have to think about multiplicities in non-spatial terms. This idea of a non-spatial multiplicity is what Bergson calls a qualitative multiplicity. And a spatial multiplicity, such as a collection of objects, is referred to as a discrete multiplicity. Let's further our understanding of qualitative multiplicity with an analysis of our musical experience. As we experience a melody unfolding, we do in some way hold the previous notes in our present experience. But do these elements stay distinct from each other in the same way that a group of objects do in space? Imagine a bag of pebbles. Any given rock in this collection remains physically the same within or without the container. Do notes of a musical phrase act this way? Is the experience of a note the same within a melody as it is played in isolation? Say we're listening to a pianist play a song in a specific key. As she executes the opening phrase with precision and grace, she accidentally hits a note outside of the key she is playing within. We automatically feel this error without even reflecting. Now imagine hearing the same note played in isolation. The feeling tone of this note as an error within a phrase is radically different from the experience of the same note played in isolation. So unlike our collection of pebbles, we can see that the notes that make up the multiplicity of our musical experience are different within the multiplicity than they are outside of it. What does this mean? This observation shows that the notes of a musical phrase are not like discrete and impenetrable objects in space, but that they must interpenetrate each other. They contain the preceding and expected notes within themselves. They contract into a fused mass and melt into the non-spatial richness of our temporal experience. We endure the musical phrase. Experience is duration. We can broaden this analysis to include all of our temporal experience. Just as the notes of a melody interpenetrate and melt into one another, so do the moments of our life. Does last week's altercation at work live within you in this present moment? Even before reflection, isn't it the case that what you did yesterday, or that amazing vacation you had last winter, somehow penetrates and mixes within your immediate present? What about the events of today? before you sat down to watch this video. These surely seep into your current experience. If we pay close attention, we can catch a glimpse of the interpenetrating fluidity of our experience, and we can begin to see that the state of ever becoming bears little to no resemblance to our linear representation of time. When we isolate events along the spatial image of a timeline, we're forced to see them as separate from each other. But remember what happened when we extracted a note from the fluid whole of the melody? It did not remain the same. The very act of isolating it altered its qualitative flavor of feel drastically. The problem here is that we do the same thing with the experience of life, and we do so without realizing it. We extract the experiences of our lives so we can order them in a representation of space, but in doing so, we alter them. Unconsciously, we then substitute this superficial and lifeless representation for the living experience of duration itself. And notice that there is a directionality to this. The moment we look back or reflect on our experience, we have separated the past from the present. This act of separation treats the past as if it were a place over there. I mean, look at how we talk about it. We say things like, look back to the past. We talk as if the past were a place in space. This tendency of thought renders the past lifelessly static, an object outside of the present. But if we refrain from this looking back and externalizing our experience, if we live in the moment, that is, truly live, the past lives within us in the thickness of the present. Sorry for repeating myself so much, but I think this is the most important point to understand before we move on to chapter 3. We must constantly remind ourselves that the qualitative realm of experience has nothing to do with the quantifiable realm of extension. 
But why are we so prone to spatializing our experience? It's because we're constantly exposed to the quantitative realm of space. We so strongly associate an experience itself with its cause that we reduce the experience to the cause. This mappability of space allows us to create the auxiliary representations of space that we use to order our experience. But in doing so, we forget what it really means to live. In the last video, I left you with the example of our experience of color. Remember how our experience of color resists all attempts of measure and is experienced as a pure quality due to our lack of a spatial correlate? I will now give you another example of our experience stripped of the rigid framework of space in order to expose the qualitative reality of our temporal experience itself. Every night when we go to bed, we withdraw our senses from the external world, yet we have an experience that persists in the form of dreams. Might we say that dreams are an experience cut off from the influence of the rigid and quantifiable realm of extension? Without any static framework to map our experience onto, we are left to the fluid domain of consciousness. If Bergson is correct, this lack of a spatial framework to map our experience onto should have a great effect on our temporal experience. I don't know about you, but my experience of time is radically different in my dreams. Have you ever woken up after what felt like hours only to realize you had dozed off for minutes? Do dreams have an ordered flow of succession or do events seem to flow into each other in a way that is so infused and so interpenetrating that any attempt to paraphrase your dream into a timeline seems unfaithful to the experience itself? The rules of space hardly remain present in our dream state other than by a faint image that is retained from living experience. But of course, this image too melts into the ever-changing fluidity of pure experience. We experience things that our waking spatialized minds cannot comprehend. For how many times have you heard someone try and explain that a character in their dream was two people at once, yet the same person? Or that a location in their dream was weirdly and indescribably more than a single location? Dreams are a unique situation that can help confirm how different our experience is when free from the quantitative grip of extension. Thanks for listening, everyone. Oh, and I just thought I'd mention this before I go. I found myself writing and rewriting the script for this chapter constantly. So much of what Bergson says is so interesting and so important that I found myself overwhelmed and constantly trying to condense every bit of information. After realizing that I was almost paraphrasing the text, I came to terms with the fact that this video series is actually a summary meant to guide the listeners, not replace the text. So I distilled the chapter into what I thought was most fundamental. If you find the concepts here interesting, I highly recommend that you read the beautifully written text itself, as I had to leave a lot out. Despite this, we have become familiar with the major concepts needed for chapter 3. In the next chapter, titled, The Organization of Conscious States, Free Will, we will approach the question of free will, reformulating it with our clear understanding of a conscious experience free from space.